Hey everyone, in this video, we are going to explore Python's built-in time module. In programming, we may need to work with date and time in many different applications. Mostly the time is maintained as the number of seconds in integer or floating point number format. For this, you need to understand the concept of epoch. The epoch is a fixed point in time. It is 1st January 1970 at midnight. Time is calculated in the form of number of seconds or milliseconds from that time until the current time. Earlier times can be represented as negatives. Why do we use this and not a string for representing dates? There are a couple of reasons for this. First, it makes it really easy to store and work with date objects. If you want to find the time difference between today and tomorrow, you can just subtract the epoch time for tomorrow with today's epoch time. Also, computers are very efficient with numbers instead of strings. It can easily calculate the values for number data type, but string may be difficult for it. So let's take a look at some of the functions for working with time in idle environment. To work with time module, we first need to import time. Once I have imported the time module, I can get the epoch time by using time.gmtime and pass 0 as the argument, which will return the epoch time in the form of struct time object. You can see that it is a struct time object from time module. It has data for year, month, day of the month, hours, minutes, seconds, weekday number, as well as some other fields. You can see that it was January 1st, 1970 midnight. If I pass any other number to this gm time function, it will return the struct time object after those many seconds from the epoch time. A day has 24 hours per day, 60 minutes per hour, and 60 seconds per minute, so a total of 86,400 seconds per day. If I use time.gm time with 86,400 seconds, it should return the second day of 1970 as you can see from this struct time object. It has this amday attribute as 2. To get the number of seconds from the epoch time, we can use time.time .time function. It returns number of seconds in decimal format for high precision. There is also time.time .time nanosecond which gives the nanoseconds since epoch time. This is useful if you want to calculate the exit seconds up to nanoseconds precision. There is also time.cTime function and if I pass specific time, it will give you the date time for that epoch time. By default, it will print the current date time. Let's calculate year time and I want to store the number of seconds per year in this variable. So a year has 365 days, 24 hours, 60 minutes per hour and 60 seconds per minute. And I'm storing this in year time variable. Now I can get current time using time.time .time and store it in t1. If I add year time variable to this variable, I get the python time next year. If I pass this value inside the time.cTime function, it will print the day after exactly one year. Now let's see how we can work with different time zones. We know that world has different time zones and some countries even represent time in different formats. First, we need to understand the concept of UTC. It's coordinated universal time it is the reference time zone. It doesn't represent any specific time zone. It's just a reference. Other time zones are defined via offset from this UTC time. 
For example, Eastern Daylight Time, where I'm located for parts of US and Canada, is 4 hours behind this UTC and it is represented as negative 4 offset from UTC. There is GMT Greenwich Mean Time which matches exactly to the UTC time. There are a couple of very important functions related to time zone. If I write time.local time, it will give me the current time in local time zone. This also returns the result in the form of struct time object. So you can see that I am recording this video in the year 2020. Local time function also takes optional seconds argument and if I pass that, it will give me the local time at that specific epoch time. By default, it passes time.time .time as the default value for that. So if I type time.local time at 0 seconds, you can see that it was 31st December 1969 when it started to count the epoch time. Similarly, there is time.gm time function which returns the UTC time at this moment. If I type time.gm time and pass the epoch of 0 seconds, I get the value of January 1st, 1970 at midnight. I can also get the time zone using time.local time using the tm zone attribute on this function. You can see that I am in the Eastern Daylight Time Zone. I can also try time.gm time dot time zone and I get back UTC as the time zone. I can also get the offsets by using time.local time dot time gmt off and I get negative 14,400 seconds. If I convert it to hours, so 14,400 divided by 60 seconds per minute and 60 minutes per hour, it will turn out to be 4 hours behind UTC time. Similarly, if I check for time.gm time dot time gmt off, I get back offset of 0. Time module also provides some functions for performance measurement. If I try time dot perf counter, it returns some number. It doesn't represent anything but next time when I call time.perf counter, you will see that I get a different number. If I want to find the difference of seconds between the moment when I executed these two statements, then I can get that by getting the difference of these two numbers. This can be very useful for performance measurement. Let's say I have a function that calculates the square of numbers and I want to find the time it takes to execute this function. In that case, I can use this time.pop counter. Let's define a function that calculates square, depth squares. It takes x as argument. I create squares as a list inside this function. Then I iterate through all the numbers from 0 to that number and append the square of those numbers into the squares variable. I'm not going to use this variable. Let's define another function calculate that takes x as argument. It first stores the time.perp counter value in the local start variable. Then it calls squares function to calculate the squares of all the numbers up to the argument we passed here. Finally, I return the difference of start and end time as time.perf counter minus start time. If I run this calculate function with 10 million as the argument, you can see that it has paused for a bit and finally, it prints this number with the number of seconds it took to calculate the square of all the numbers. Python also provides time.perf counter nanosecond that can be useful to calculate time with higher accuracy. 
time module also provides star f time function that formats the time in nice looking date time string. This function takes the format as the first argument. This will be the format we want to see our string output. And the second argument is the seconds in epoch time format. If I write time.starf time with format as this, and if I pass the second argument as time.gm time, you can see that it's August 27, 2020. Let me copy this line and put it here. If I replace this gm time function call with local time as the second argument, you can see that I am 4 hours behind the UTC time. You don't need to remember this format string. You can always check the documentation. Here you can see all the possible formats you can provide to this string and experiment with those formats in the REPL environment. Here you can see that I used percent %y to format the year in four digits. It says year with century as a decimal number. Similarly, I also used percent %h to represent the r in 0 to 23 hours. If you scroll down, you can see that there is also star p time function that parses the time from the string you pass to that function. It takes first argument as the date time string and second argument as the format of the date time string. Finally, time module also has sleep function that will suspend the execution of the current thread for given number of seconds. This is very useful when you want to rate limit your application code. For example, if there is rate limiting on a web application and you are trying to scrape that web application, suppose they allow only one request per five minutes, then you can suspend the thread that makes request to this web application for about 300 seconds and that way you can meet the requirement of rate limiting from that application. If I try this in idle with three seconds, you can see that our REPL doesn't do anything for three seconds and then it returns this cursor ready to accept new commands. So those were some of the basic functions you can use from the time module. There are better ways to work with Python date time using date time module, but I just wanted to give you a brief idea on this time module in case you come across this in code written by other developers. I hope this video was informative for you. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel to receive more video lessons like this one. If you want to support me, please share this video with everyone trying to learn Python. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you in the next video with some more Python lessons.